Welcome to the CX Central podcast and video cast. I'd love to welcome Daniel Lord all the way from Germany. Welcome, Daniel. Hi, Justin. Fantastic to be talking to you uh, yet again. I'm very excited to talk about our topic today, which is going to be all things CCXP. Yes, and you know I have a passion for that topic, so thanks for having me on, Justin. No, always a pleasure. So for, if you are for listening to this, uh, welcome. It is a podcast. It's also you might be watching this on video. We have a YouTube channel or you'll be seeing this video on our CX Skills website, which is where we advertise all our courses, both the um, ones that I run and, of course, with Daniel as well and some other trainers. And um, today what we want to do is really talk about uh, CCXP because a lot of people are a bit confused about what is this CCXP thing and why do I need it, etc. So if you've been in that mode... Uh, we're going to answer all of those questions for you today. So I'm going to go straight to you, Daniel, with the first question. I just want you to tell me a little bit about the CCXP credentials and, uh, you know, how they all came about, etc. Sure, I will, Justin. And I think you have a nice slide showing a few logos there. So I'll use that to kind of give us a visual aid as we walk through this. So. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Okay. Well, the CCXP, as you can see in the logo there, stands for Certified uh, Customer Experience Professional. It's an individual certification. And it was put together and it's administered by the CXPA, which is the Customer Experience Professionals Association. And that's the logo that you see on the right. Um, and one of the factor, or factors that drew me to the CCXP credential some years back was the CXPA is a nonprofit independent association. And I think when you're looking at a global certification, that's really, really important. And it's helpful to remember that until the CXPA established this credential, roughly back in 2011, 2012, there was really no way for a CX professional to demonstrate or prove out their level of CX expertise. And Justin, we talk about this a lot. Doesn't it seem like today everyone's a CX expert? Oh my God, I look at my LinkedIn feed and I, I literally, I reckon every third person is suddenly a CX expert, Dan, right? Well, suddenly they've just grown from nowhere. Yeah. And, and again, I mean, we, we honor the profession and we honor people working in it. But I have to say when, for me, the question is, where's the proof? If you're a CX professional, where's the proof? And for me, the CCXP really demonstrates that that proof there. For example, currently, I just looked it up a couple days ago, there are about 1130 CCXPs worldwide. Um, and when I see a person with those letters after their name, I feel like I know them. Obviously, I do not know 1133 people. But when I see XXX CCXP or ABC CCXP, I know what they've been through. I know what they've studied. I know the kinds of questions that they had to answer correctly. And that gives me a level, level of comfort and trust with them. So, Yeah, and it is good to see. I am seeing those people with those letters next to their name. And I know a lot of people are probably going, what the hell does that mean? And well, now they're going to find out. Yeah, and, and it is an individual certification. So I know some people do ask me, if I leave my company and go to another company, do I take this with me? And it's absolutely, the CCXP belongs to you. And when you pass it and can put those letters after your name, I think it's very helpful. And let me give you a few other things we're seeing in the marketplace. Many companies, and, and I admittedly, it's very much in the US at this point, the UK, but I think we're going to see this spread. When they're advertising for a CX professional, they're putting CCXP required or CCXP preferred. That's right. So yeah. even hiring, isn't that great? Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's kind of like, because if you're an HR person or you're a recruiter, in all honesty, how are you going to validate the level of knowledge that someone has? And no, the you're right. And we are seeing that now in Asia Pacific too, Dan. So we are, we are absolutely starting to see that in the jobs down here. And it's only going to increase, right, as time goes on. That is, I'm glad to hear that. That's cool. And then I, I think the other thing that I'm, I'm seeing here is that there are some tech providers out there, especially for the industry, and they do a lot of content management, as you know, doing blogs and reports and that kind of thing. Many of these tech providers, they go out specifically to CCXPs to get quotes, to get insights, to do interviews. And so one of their internal requirements, and they've told me this is, Dan, everyone out there is quote unquote, a CX expert. But when we go out and look for someone to give us a valid quote or insight, we only go for CCXPs or we make sure because it's the only way we know that this person knows what they're talking about. And then there's one other thing I'm seeing because 
As you know, I do a lot of judging for these global CX awards and CX awards are different than contact center or customer service awards. And I'm noticing the level of maturity and sophistication in these awards entries and the pro programs or projects these people are working on keeps going up. Now, it turns out a lot of the people entering these awards happen to be CCXPs. But what really is impressing me is the level of sophistication I'm seeing in CX out there in real companies. And let me tell you what I think that means for me. The divide between those who really are CX experts and yielding results and those that aren't, but perhaps claim to be, is widening and widening. And I think that's going to continue over time. Yeah, there's no doubt. And uh, we're also going to talk about that last little logo down the bottom a bit later in this oh, presentation yeah. <laughs> because I'm dying for uh, people to understand just how important that recognised trainer provider status is. So we'll be talking about that uh, in a couple of questions time. So hang in there. Um, my, my next question I wanted to ask you was really around, uh, we've mentioned CCXP, you've sort of set the framework now that it is global, that you it's individual and you get the letters next to your name if you get the uh, credential. But what's covered in the credential? Because CX is such a broad spray Daniel so um what what's actually included or what what's it mean to have the CCXP credential I think that's a fair question and it's one that I get asked a lot so if you don't mind Justin we've got another slide that shows the six competencies here yeah let's have a look here we go yeah okay through research through work in the industry and the community there are six CX competencies or if you prefer domains of knowledge um, that any CCXP candidate needs to have and this is because these are the proven factors in organizations that are doing well in CX versus perhaps those that aren't doing so well in CX. And they're pretty big. Um, I'll just read through each one very quickly. Customer experience strategy, VOC, which stands for voice of customer, customer insight and understanding, experience design, improvement and innovation, metrics measurement and ROI is return on investment, organizational adoption and accountability, and customer-centric culture. And I think what's helpful when you look at this is these six competencies cover the totality of CX. They cover the entire big picture of what CX is. But it's important to also say that each one of these competencies is independent. So for example, if you look at CX strategy, it has its own principles, practices, methods, and an entire set of sub-competencies that we need to know. If you look at customer-centric culture, it's the same thing. It's got its own methods, practices, principles, an entire set of sub-competencies that people need to know. So when in our workshop, when I teach these, we do go through these one by one. And as we go through the first, the second, the third, then we begin to make the connections between how does your customer experience strategy domain impact your VOC domain and back and forth? How does a customer centric culture impact the other domains? But I just want to point out that each one is treated independently and each one of these, as we'll talk about in a minute, is covered in the CCXP exam. So. Yeah, that's a great that's a great overview. So, all right, so you've got the six core competencies, and um, I mean, we touched on voice of customer, for example, and we know there's a lot of things yep. that sit under that, like net promoter score, for example. Um, so, yep. is it is it a reasonable expectation to to say, hey, if I do this course, uh, am I going to come out of this as an NPS expert, um, or am I just going to get a holistic sort of overview of all of them? I know because I've sat through the course twice, but let's see, inform our <laughs> listeners, Daniel, of uh, how it actually works. You are sitting in the shoes of the listeners, and that's part of what makes you so great, Justin, so no problem. What's important to understand here is there are a lot of competencies and things to understand uh, in customer experience. So maybe I share just a few of the competencies under each one, or I should say sub-competencies under each one of these six domains, and I'll specifically address NPS here in just a second because that always comes up. So starting at the top, um, in the CX strategy component, a CCXP candidate, and I'll use that term, needs to know how to develop a, a solid CX strategy, how to articulate a CX vision, the role of corporate strategy, the role of corporate brand values, and how to develop meaningful employee performance standards around CX. Those are some of the sub-competencies. Under VOC, the candidate needs to know very well quantitative and qualitative research practices the role and definition of journey mapping and personas and barriers to VOC success, for example. Under experience design, which is one of my personal favorites, 
the candidate needs to know each and every step of the human-centered design process, how it works, what it does, as well as definitions of terms such as co-creation, ideation, and prototyping. So that's an important uh, set of sub-competencies there. Now, when you get to metrics, measurements, and ROI, again, one of my personal favorite competencies, the candidate needs to know things like data architecture. And data architecture consists of metrics that can be described as descriptive or perception-based or outcome-based. They need to know how to calculate ROI. Some people do ask, are there some calculations on the CCXP exam? Yes, there are. There are some calculations. And, and one of the most important things in CX is proving your value to the organization. So that means being able to calculate what is ROI. So you have to actually go through some scenarios where you do that. Yeah. We do touch on NPS in that section because NPS is considered to be a CX metric. That's an important part, but it's only one of perhaps 25 or 30 different CX metrics that we talk about. Sure. And just to, maybe here I share my own personal experience. I found the CCXP journey incredible. I really benefited a lot from the preparation, the studying, the reading, the learning, that kind of thing. And after I got my CCXP, then I looked at all the different domains and competencies and said, where would I like to deepen my understanding? So for NPS, I actually took a formal NPS masterclass. That masterclass has nothing to do with the CCXP and nothing to do with the CXPA. It was put together by one of the founders of NPS. That took me about a month, just a month, to yep. deepen my know-how of NPS. It links back to my CCXP certification. But no, to answer your question the long way around, you're not going to leave this course being an NPS expert because this is not an NPS class. Can I give another example? Yeah, please. Um, another example is for me is human-centered design, the experience design competency. I love this competency. What So what I did for myself after going through the CCXP and getting my credential, I went into the IDEO curriculum. IDEO is a very well-known global provider of of training, research, and consulting practice around human-centered design. Now, I spent six months taking that curriculum, but I felt it was important for me personally, and of course, I think it's helpful to the participants in our classes because I can talk about human-centered design from the CXPA perspective, but also from the practitioner perspective as well. And Justin, I think there were a couple competencies I haven't explained a, a little bit more deeply here, and forgive me for doing that. Um, in organizational adoption and accountability, let me just share a couple of the sub-competencies here. Um, the candidate needs to be able to describe the characteristics of a successful CX leader, and they have to explain how an organization keeps CX front and center in terms of all the business decisions are made. There's also some discussion about how do you put CX into the organization because there are a few different models structurally as to how CX is rolled out within an organization. And the last one, customer-centric culture. Everyone loves customer-centric culture. And here, a few of the sub-competencies sub would be defining what is a customer-centric culture, what are cultural beliefs, how does culture tie to your CX strategy, um, what are the roles of things like rituals and training and socialization in building a customer-centric culture? So there's actually quite a lot that's covered here. There's a heap um, that's covered there. And I think to put in a context, the workshop that you run um, for the CCXP preparation that you do with, with me through CX Skills is is essentially, uh, what, 16 hours. It's it's four four-hour sessions. And as you said, if someone's sort of thinking of doing this course and you want to be an NPS expert, you, know, you did a one-month course just on MPS. So I think what yeah. this this is really great for is giving you the breadth or the holistic view of CX, right? And so you know all the different components. Yeah, and, and you know, Justin, you led so beautifully to a statement I have to say in our discussion here. CX can be described as a set of specialties. So when you go and look at any of these six domains, let's look at VOC, for example, the ability to craft a survey, design a survey scale, write those questions, roll it out, get response rates, interpret the data using regression and correlation and all these research terms, that is a specialized function. When you look at experience design and you're using the human-centered design process of researching and analyzing and ideating, that is a specialized function. And I think that's what a lot of people 
don't step back and think about when they think of CX, they sometimes still think of CX as I call it customer service on steroids. <laughs> but this is not customer service on steroids. No, no, it's it's customer service is a completely different topic. So I think you can see the level of expertise. So the requirement here is that anybody that's a CX professional understands all of these domains. It doesn't necessarily mean, as you said, you're going to go and set up an MPS program. You might need some NPS work there. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to go and be able to do journey mapping well. You probably need to do some deep diving into journey mapping and, and journey and personas. But you'll know what these terms are. You'll know how to articulate them. You'll be able to understand them in relationship to each other. I think that's the real value here. Yeah, absolutely. And I love the way you articulated it. Um, I think it's really important to note for people um, in regards to your workshop or preparing for the CCXP that you don't have to do the exam. Um, a lot of people just do it purely for what you just mentioned because they want awareness of all the different components of CX. They want to know enough to be dangerous, but not necessarily an expert at all of it. Uh, and that's what this, this workshop that you offer essentially does. But for those that do want to go on and get those lovely letters next to their name, uh, so it looks good on LinkedIn, in and on your resume and uh, enables you to opt in to uh, job opportunities mm. where it is now a requirement. Obviously, you've got to go through an exam, Dan. So my next question to you is, can you tell me a little bit about the CCXP exam itself? I'm happy to, having been through it myself, I'll share my experience. And Justin, I think I have a, a final slide for our talk today that lists some of the points that people might be able to visually see. I love what you just said about attending a course like the one we run. I have definitely two different types of folks attending. The first type of, of person is, Dan, I'm thinking of taking the CCXP exam. I want to take the CCXP exam. And I believe that this workshop will help me prepare for that. And that's brilliant. There's a second kind of person that says, you know, Dan, I'm not really interested in the CCXP exam or I'm not interested yet. No problem. They gain exactly the same overview of CX on the understanding of the competencies. They know that those competencies were put together by a nonprofit independent association. They know they're getting really a great perspective on what CX is. And the CCXP exam is really up to you. So you can decide to take it the week after the class, for example. You can decide to take it a year after the class. You can decide to never take the exam. Again, I think you bring that up correctly. Now, going back to the, the slide, there is something else I need to say. The first point on the slide basically says not everybody is eligible to take the exam. You must apply for the exam. The CXPA has very strict and clear eligibility criteria, which involves how many years you've actually worked in a CX role and, super important, your individual and personal exposure across all six of those CX competencies. So what has been your participation and exposure to CX strategy? What has been your participation or exposure to metrics, measurements, and ROI. You literally have to write under each competency kind of your application there explaining to the board, this has been my uh, actual exposure. And they'll look at that and they'll either approve you to take the exam or not take the exam. But let me say this. I don't want people who don't feel they're ready to take the exam to look at this in a negative way. I see it as an opportunity. And I work with a lot of participants and when they're crafting their words here that they're gonna say. They might say at the end of the class, you know, Dan, I realize I have very little actual practical experience with experience design. I've never been involved in human-centered design. What should I do? And I said, well, this is the opportunity. You go to your boss, hopefully you got a good one here, and you say, boss, look, I'm really pursuing this certification. It does require that I have a level of hands-on experience with experience design. Are there some projects I can be assigned to in the company? Can I start a project? Can you put me on a cross-functional team? In other words, you can work on these things. You can build your understanding. But I find that people that take the class or fully understand the six competencies have a much better roadmap to what they need to do versus people that don't know the six competencies or don't know exactly what's required. So I do want to point that out straight away. And Justin, if you go back very quickly to the slide, I'll just Absolutely. run down the points, remaining points on the exam here. So we've got it. Approval requires work experience in a CX role and demonstration of hands-on experience. By the way, the CXPA website has all of this very carefully outlined on it. So when people are really interested, it's the cxpa.org website that will help you here. 
when you're approved to take the exam, the cool part is you get to schedule this at your own time, at your own leisure. There, around the world, there are these authorized testing centers where they actually run the CCXP exam. So you would go online, you'd find the testing center closest to you, perhaps, and you would literally book a slot to go and take the test. Because this is a no book, no notes test. So for example, a few years ago, I took my test in Singapore, because as you know, I was living in Singapore at that time. And when I went in, they even took my specs and checked to make sure there were no cameras inside. They take away your phone, blah, 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 put it all in a locker. They scanned me. And while I was taking the exam, there are actually video cameras to monitor you and so forth. And I think that that's really fine. By the way, you do get a calculator. They will give you a calculator. They do give you some scratch paper and a pencil. During the pandemic period, I do believe the CXP has come up with methods where you could, in principle, take the exam at home. There are some technical requirements there. If you're one of these folks that is in a situation where you can't really or don't feel comfortable going out, you can always check in with the CXPA to do a version of taking the test at home. Now, the exam itself is comprised of 100 multiple choice questions. So you read the question or, or and you select A, B, C, or D, and there's 100 of them. And you need to get an 80% or more to pass. And by the way, those 100 questions are drawn from across the six competency areas that we talked about earlier. Yep. Yep. And one other point, because I, I had a participant just pass his exam a couple weeks ago, and he wrote to me and said, Dan, I didn't know I would find out right away. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you find out right away. So the point being, when you're sitting in that exam room and you click that last question, and by the way, these systems are cool. You can go back, you can go forward, you can change answers, blah, 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 blah. It's a very well-designed system, one question at a time. But it actually will say, are you ready to submit? And then when you press submit, almost instantaneously, it comes up with what your score was. And, you passed or you didn't pass. Oh, wow. There'd be a big, you'd take a big breath before you hit that submit button, wouldn't you? It's, uh... Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I think my hair was actually black before the test. <laughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't go back to its original yeah. color. But the Damn point it. being is, you know, when I see these 1130 C6Ps around the world and I know that they went through exactly that same process, I always say it, it feels like a shared experience. So one day if I meet them in Sao Paulo or San Antonio or Singapore or Switzerland, I'm sure we'll sit down for five or seven minutes and how was the exam, how did it feel? Because it's really quite something to get that moment. So. Absolutely. And then we should say, and we'll talk about it a little bit later um, uh, in the next section actually, um, but there is a cost to sit the exam as well. So if you do want to actually go forward and sit for your credentials, there is a, a cost. And if you fail, well, you got to pay again to sit the exam. So there's some interest yeah. in, in wanting to do well, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I think we're going to talk shortly about our course and how we work, Justin. And yeah, we'll actually, we'll, we, we will get to that. But the, the next thing I wanted to really talk to you about, I'm going to go back to that first um, slide that we showed everyone, Dan, which was sure. the three logos. So we had the CCXP, which is essentially the Certified Customer Experience Professionals. So that's the association, the CCXP, A, sorry, the association, CCXP is the CERT. I got it the <laughs> wrong way around. Uh, and that's getting very, okay. it's very easy to get confused because they look so similar but the the cxpa is the association the ccxp is the certification i think that's the distinction yes. for people to make but that other logo that you put there dan is the cxpa recognized training provider and i think it's something that we really should focus in on dan because well let's just say it's a little bit special there's only 10 people in the world that uh, are authorized to have that uh, and you are one of those 10 so first of all congratulations because I know there was a huge Thanks. amount of work that you put into it to get to that status now some people probably go that's great but what's it mean for me so the question <laughs> I want to ask is what does that mean Dan why is it good if you do a course with a recognized training provider opposed to some of the other providers that don't have that status well, it's a fair question. Yeah, I think there's just about nine or 10 of us at this point around the world. Basically, what it means, and, and I have to be a little bit that legal terms and conditions stuff, is it, it means the CXPA themselves have looked at my course. They've looked at my background. They've read about me. They've asked for testimonials. They want validation that a person they certify, if that's the word, that they say meets their standards, in fact, will deliver to their expectations. And I like that they're very particular about this. 
they keep this population of recognized training providers. It's not an easy process. As a matter of fact, someone from Australia wrote to me on LinkedIn the other day and said, I don't know why we don't have more recognized training providers in Australia. And I said, I can't answer that question either. But what I can tell you is it's, it's a journey. And Justin, for me, I spent two years writing this course, two years. Now, I've been teaching customer this and customer that and contact center and CRM for 20 years. I founded my company 20 years ago, and we, we've been doing this kind of training around CRM and CX and so forth. So obviously, that gave me a big advantage. But even with those advantages of time and experience and exposure, I still spent two years going through every single competency, making sure the case studies, the examples, the exercises. In this particular course, just our exercise guide is about 100 pages. And those 100 pages cover example quizzes. People love that. We actually design quizzes for each of the competencies yep. in the multiple choice format so people get a flavor. We have calculations. You've been through the course twice, you know, yep. and, and a lot of discussion as well. So if you're asking me what the recognized training provider means in general, I think what it means for people is the person that's taking you on this journey, because it's just like we're accompanying you on the journey a bit, and I'll talk about that knows what they're talking about and has been validated by the CXPA. Yeah, thank you. It, it, it really does help. And I think, you know, if you're listening to this or you haven't met Daniel before, one thing that comes across pretty clearly, clearly is one, he's very passionate about uh, customer experience <laughs> and he has a lot of experience. And as you said, two years just to put this course together. And I have sat through it twice. Maybe I'm a slow learner and I need to sit through it a third time. But, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, but it's, no, a, um, no. it's a great course. And, and the style in which Daniel does the workshops is fantastic because he always gets you to do the quiz first and you're like, oh, geez, I don't know a few of these. But you do the you do the quiz again after the learnings, and then all of a sudden you go, oh wow, I really have learned something. It's a great validation that uh, it's actually all sinking in because there is a lot. It is a lot, and we cram a lot into this course. It is a two day course normally physically. Obviously, with online now, we've gone to the four by four hour um, workshops, but you cover a lot of ground. Yeah, and you know what we've learned about this online, Justin? Because obviously, starting roughly in April or whatever, we started a lot of online delivery was, for example, when we do these quiz questions in the exercise guide, now we do it as an online poll. So people are actually clicking the answers and we're all saying, you know, if we change the model a little bit, and another reason I like the way you're doing it, these four by four sessions is, there are some readings, there are some things people can do on their own. There are some short videos to watch. So people can do that as quote unquote homework. And then we spend our time in the class together, actually talking and talking and talking. And Justin, maybe this is where I throw you my museum analogy. Oh, I, I love your museum this. analogy. Yes, hit us with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's my museum analogy with a setup like that. Um, it's always important to remind people that there is no requirement to take a training or a workshop to take the CCXP exam. The CXPA does not require that you take a course. I think it's a decision people make. And, and the analogy I use is going to a museum. There are some people that go to a museum, they go independently or maybe with a loved one, they just walk around. I wanna see this, I wanna see that, I wanna see the Mona Lisa, I wanna see the Velazquez, I wanna see the Picasso. And they learn on their own and maybe they read the placard below the painting and here's the date it was painted, blah, 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 blah. That's, that's a persona, that's one kind of museum goer. There's a different kind of museum goer, and I call these people the, the tour guide people. They like to join tours. They like to have a tour guide take them around. And I think the reason I like this analogy is when you join a tour, it's not just you and the tour guide, it's you, all the other people on the tour and the tour guide. So the tour guide, obviously, when he or she takes you by the Picasso or whatever they take you by, they give you the history, the context, and what I always find interesting about museum tours is they tell you what to look for. How do I know this is a work of art? Look at what is it that makes this painting worth X versus the local gallery down my street where it's, it's Y. And then the, the museum guide gives you all that. I see myself as the museum tour guide. I'm giving people a tour through CX with the understanding that you've got other people with you on the journey and you're gonna bounce a lot of these things back and forth off other people. So I welcome people into our museum tour, in this case, the class, while I also respect people that choose to do this on their own. There's always gonna be different personas with different needs, so. 
What a great analogy. And, it, and it's so true. And I think the one thing I love about sitting in your workshops is, and it's a little bit like the tour guide, you have great stories that go with it. Um, you've, yeah, got, yeah. You've, got, you've got real practical stories. And I think that's where the value really comes out because you bring it to life. I mean, we could all go and read a book. Um, but I think when you sit through this workshop and you hear your experiences and the stories that go with it and you hear the other people's stories because, you know, in a group and we have relatively small groups for this um, program, you know, we do get to hear from the others as participants and it's great because you get to learn from, as you said, their experiences as well. I am always intrigued by what people have experienced and felt, what they respond to, how they respond to it. I think I think it's it's never boring. It's never repetitive. It's always, I don't know. I, I, I would never be bored being a museum tour guide. I'm never bored running the CX class. It always is motivating for me. So. We've known each other for a number of years and your passion has not waned one little bit. If nothing else, it's getting uh, even deeper. <laughs> so, um, so if people are, look, are looking at doing this workshop, we do have it uh, on our CX Skills website. So it's just uh, cxskills.com.au. We run the course uh, publicly uh, roughly every couple of months. So depending on when mm. you're listening to this podcast or you're watching this video, we do have one coming up at the start of December. Our next one's in February 2021 and then there'll be some you know, flowing on from there it is a popular course and and as we said right at the start we're seeing that more and more people now are going um hey you need to have that ccxp uh certification to get your foot in the door now for some cx roles so i think this is only going to grow in stature uh as the years go by i think one of the things that we should also add in dan is uh, and we did mention there is a price to pay if you want to sit the exam um but as a recognized yes. um training provider you actually get a 15 percent uh coupon discount as well, so if people want to join the CCX, sorry, CCX CXPA, and do their certification, um, then they can save fifteen percent, and that's uh, a good saving as well, right? Yeah, I think there's a few things we offer in the course. Obviously, one is you know we've done a lot of the heavy lifting for our, our students because it does take a lot of time to research and and study and prepare all these competencies. Now, if you're not in a big rush. And you have the one, two, three years to do that, or you know, again, it's different for different people. Again, by all means, we we've, we've been through that journey. The CXPA recognizes the journey we've been through. And Justin, one thing that we may have forgotten to mention is for anybody that goes through the course, I'm always there to do another hour, two hours, one on one. I don't like the word coaching so much. But, uh, you know, discussion with you. We hop on Zoom. You tell me, Dan, I'm about to take the exam next week. Can I run some ideas or, or questions by you? I'm always there for any participant that goes through this course, whether you want to talk to me a week after we do the course or a year after we do the course. It doesn't matter. You just pop me an email. We do the one on one coaching part. Yeah. And, and I we think that's a really, 15%. really important um, thing to make sure people understand. So, um, and having sat through this, so anyone who does the, the workshop with Daniel, you do get that one hour session one on one with Daniel. It is not a consulting exercise. It is not trying to sell no. you business. It's not trying to sell you another course. It is literally to help you prepare for your exam. So if that's something that you're considering to doing, I can assure you to get one-on-one -on -one with someone of Daniel's stature is worth the course alone, to be honest. Uh, it's just, but it's a fantastic bonus for anyone that is actually thinking of going forward and getting the certification as well. And Justin, there's something I, I mean, you know, we're probably coming to the end of our discussion here, but so a point I'd like to make is for many people, the shorter term to midterm goal is to get the CCXP, which I fully understand, respect, and I'm here for you on that journey. Yeah. But my ultimate goal is not just that you get the credential, because to me, the getting the credential is the only, only the beginning. Mm -hmm. It's what you do with the credential that really matters. So I see my job as short and midterm to help you earn that credential longer term help you be successful at work that is my ultimate goal i want you to write to me in a year or two and say dan where we've done this really cool stuff with voc or we've done this really cool stuff realigning our metrics blah 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 and that's what totally makes my day and reading some of your testimonials daniel it is clear that that actually happens so um and and to share my personal story with everyone i have sat um through the course twice obviously i organize it with daniel and we host um it through cx skills so i get the luxury of i guess sitting in um but i still haven't sat for my exam and i am very cognizant of the fact that uh, i need to put in a bit of study um, 
um, before the exam. And there's a couple of books that I'll need to read. There's some practice trivia quizzes. There's a fair bit of work and I get, you know, life gets in the way and I haven't got around to doing it. And I, for me personally, I go, you know, I just need some clean air so I can just go, hey, I need to focus on this and give it some, you know, due respect for a month or two leading up to the exam. So I feel like I'm really prepared. Um, But the stuff really sinks in. And so even if you don't sit, as Daniel was saying, even if you don't go forward and do the exam, the learnings that you will get out of this course, I promise you will help you in your day-to-day life, whether you're in CX or in contact centres. And and that's the last point that I want to raise, Don, is uh, Daniel, is because we do get a lot of um, people that see our stuff are obviously in the contact centre industry and while it's great and, you know, we've both spent, you know, many decades in contact centres, um, but CX is obviously a much broader scope. So there's certainly, if you're looking at expanding your career opportunities, wow, what a perfect opportunity with a, with a contact centre background to then pivot into CX. I could, you know, every single senior contact centre person I come across or I've worked with in the past, I'm like, look, and I can be a little controversial here. Don't just rebrand everything you do in contact center CX because this rebranding doesn't change the fact that you're not CX, you're contact center. There are different sets of business disciplines. Yeah. If you truly put that aside and say, look, I'm a master of contact center, I love it, customers rock, et cetera, et cetera. But maybe I should really learn what this CX is all about, what these six competencies cover. I believe me, you will be so powerful. I keep thinking of like a Marvel superhero. (laughs) You're going to have the secret power or the power of contact center and customer service and the power of CX. And honestly, that's almost unbeatable. I don't know so many people who officially have both sides. I would like to see more contact center people explore the CX domain um, in a structured and assumption-free way, if that makes sense. Put aside that you know contact center and say, I need to learn CX and go for it. I want to see more contact center people. Yeah. I went through that journey and it was incredible. And now I can see both ecosystems far more clearly. So anyway, that's that's our two cents or our eight uh, cents. It on is. Contact. Well, that's right. It, it's such a huge asset to have. And there's very few people in the world, as you said, that have a foot in both camps that have actually experienced yeah. both. And uh, I think it's going to be great for, for both industries if we can <laughs> accelerate that because, you know, the contact centre, as we know, uh, contributes a lot, but it's not everything. CX is much bigger than just the contact centre. That's another discussion, which I'm sure we've probably had. And we'll, keep having. we'll have that one. <laughs> uh, no doubt. So uh, uh, look, Daniel, that you've really um, answered some I hope a lot of the questions that people might have around the CXPA or the CCXP credentials. But of course, if anyone has some other questions uh, about it, um, they can obviously reach out to you on LinkedIn. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, You can pop us an email through the CX Skills website. Uh, And if you're obviously looking at doing a workshop, uh, we we, uh, host them all for Daniel down here across Asia Pacific. So if there's something that you're looking to do, uh, get in touch. Um, Daniel does both the public ones, but we can also do private ones. If you've got a number of employees that you want to put through the CX program, uh, then we can put together um, private ones as well. And Justin, I have to say, I'm so excited, for example, in the upcoming sex course, you've got participants from Australia and Asia. And having lived in Asia for 20 years and worked so extensively in that region, I couldn't be happier because isn't this the beauty of our new online life, yeah. which is as long as the time zone isn't too crazy, you can sign in anywhere well it's exactly right i mean and for the last couple of years we've obviously flown you out from uh from germany right we've had you over in australia for a couple of weeks and we've you know hired a a hotel and done the whole thing but uh yeah this online world does bring some added benefits and uh and i think also the fact that it is just four hours a day because a lot of us are busy it does give you a chance to still stay on top of your emails and not get too far behind and uh, i think that's you know attractive for a lot of people that are obviously busy these days so Speaking of busy, Daniel, I'm sure you've got about a zillion other things to do. So uh, thank you so much for your time again. It's always great to catch up and uh, we really look forward to this next course in uh, December and obviously the ones beyond there. You got it. See you soon, Justin. Thank you again.